Good morning. It is Long Haul Tanker, Straight Razor Shaving with Long Haul Tanker. And uh, as a little side note, as we get started this morning, uh, video number 201, my last video from home here, uh, was number 200. And so for me, uh, it's amazing to me to be uh, up to that number of videos, uh, Straight Razor Shaving videos on YouTube. Anyway, uh, and now for the uh, 250 plus uh, subscribers that I have, I say thank you very much uh, for subscribing and joining me. I appreciate your continued uh, viewership and uh, hit the like and subscribe button. Leave a comment if you so desire and go on over to The Shaving Cadre, www.theshavingcadre.com. And of course, we're getting set up this morning for a straight razor shave and uh, using all the best stuff uh, that I've got. And you'll see as we go on, let me go ahead and introduce the equipment for this morning. We're using good old Count Engelbert, Boker Count Engelbert the second, nice gold etching, gold uh, surfacing, uh, nice sculpted spines, beautiful honeycomb, honeycomb, honey colored uh, uh, scales, horn scales, just absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Just love this. Honed it up and, uh, and finished it on a uh, Arkansas uh, hard black. And so it does very well. We should have an excellent shave this morning. And to complement to complement the razor, we're using the Plasson number 20, 30 millimeter uh, high mountain white uh, in genuine horn. And it's a good beefy, heavy uh, uh, handle on that. So I'm very pleased with that. And uh, to use your best razor and to use your best, I say best brush, certainly the most expensive brush, uh, we're using Martin de Condre Fougere for our soap this morning. And I'm going to precede that uh, by using some Cremo uh, Original uh, on as a kind of a pre-shave on my face. And uh, let's get started. Got a, a bowl of nice hot water. Today is Thursday, the uh, 26th, 2022, at approximately 11 a.m., about 11.05 a.m. I did use the clippers this morning and buzz my head. All right. Going to get a dab here. Of the Cremo. Okay, I've got that worked in. Now let's start lathering the Fougere, Martin de Condre Fougere with the Plasson. And we're going to get a nice, it lathers up so well.
using kind of an up and down bouncing motion on top of the uh, jar to suck up all that lather up into the inner reaches core of the knot. All right, got the Martin de Condre. Well, I hope everybody's doing fine this morning. Enjoying your wet shaving, straight razor shaving along the way. As I do. Watching videos last night, late night, I don't know. I say late night, we went to bed early. Last night it was a full day. And I'll tell you more about that in just a minute. Um watching shaving videos, fell asleep, watching Bill M uh, in his uh, dare I call it a rant. That's okay, Bill. You can do a rant, especially when people are attacking you uh, unnecessarily, I will add. You know, honing is a uh, is a personal matter, and there are traditions of honing that go back a long way. Uh, even on the record in writing, it'd be interesting to see if some of those, <laughs> if those guys in the early 1800s, if they had had YouTube back then, what it'd be like to watch them today uh, explaining their, uh, and demonstrating their techniques. I think that'd be very interesting to watch them. And uh, we're all entitled to hone. It's like uh, one fellow says, it's just steel on stone. And uh, your property, hone it as you see fit. Uh, the idea of preserving, and you know, we all wanna, you know, if, you, if we work with vintage, Razors, there's a certain love and nostalgia that uh, that we want to preserve them for posterity, but you're under no obligation to do so. None at all. You know, if, if you want to have vintage razors declared a national treasure under federal law, have at it. Uh, 
But in the meantime, it's my property. Uh, now the Boker here I'm using this morning is not vintage, an old vintage razor, like a old Wade and Butcher uh, pre-1891. But, uh, and while we may deem them in our heart as a national treasure, they're not. They're not. And the reason is, I suspect, is because they could be reproduced today. Uh, they could. Why couldn't they? It's not like a uh, Rembrandt or a uh, Van Gogh piece of art uh, deemed a national treasure because of both the uh, beauty and technique of the uh, piece of uh, art or painting or sculpture. Uh, who was the great uh, sculptor, uh, Raphael or something like that? I don't, I don't remember, but it's not just the material. It's not just the craftsmanship or the technique. It's also the artists themselves. Anyway, uh, so I support uh, Bill M and his right to say and practice what he wants to. And to not support it seems small and petty. With no clear cut evidence to take that position other than tyranny. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say on that. Appreciate you, Bill. Carry on. <clears throat> Actually, Bill's the one that introduced me to the Shaving Cadre. And he's a regular participant on the uh, Sunday Zoom calls, as I try to be. Not always there, but... being on Sunday night on the weekend, and if should I be at home on the weekend, 
it's difficult. It's easier for me to make the Sunday Zoom calls when I'm on a load on a, out in the truck on the road. Um, my wife is less uh, uh, likely to exercise superior priority. <laughs> but yesterday... Let's talk about yesterday for a little bit. Not a couple of things I want to. Let's see, where am I? Yesterday morning was my doctor's appointment for, I go every six months, do the blood work. Do the physical. Yesterday was physical day. The six month visit in the early part of the year is always the physical. The six month visit in the latter part of the year is just blood work and check up and follow up. And really the main difference between the two, <laughs> the main difference between the two, uh, and, and gentlemen, you'll understand what I mean when I say it's the finger. But uh, pending blood work, uh, the things that they were able to determine on site while I was there, everything's good. Blood pressure's good. Pulse, EKG uh, is good. Um, and so all of this is really, there are things I've got to do with my primary care physician and or cardiologist every so often uh, in preparation for my DOT physical, uh, so I can maintain my uh, CDL license. Of course, I've had long-standing relationships with my primary care physician in particular, the cardiologist, this, this one I've been with for three years now. DOT requires me to get a uh, a uh, stress test, cardiac stress test, uh, every two years. I have a valid one from last year, so I don't have to do it before March the 4th this year. And I may very well drag it on until I keep pressing. I even stopped by his office yesterday, the cardiologist. Uh, he's on the second floor. My primary care is on the third floor of the building we go to.
<clears throat> and so uh, my wife and I both went. She does, we do our six month visits together. Uh, I'm home from a, my loads and, and uh, so we kill two birds with one stone. And we go to the same doctor. And so sometime between now and before the uh, medical card expires on March the 4th, I'll be going to the DOT uh, location that my company uh, contracts with. My employer, I should say, it's not my company. Which leads me all of this stuff about DOT, medical license, you know, medical stuff, and kind of leads me generally into a discussion of uh, 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 trucking and uh, CDL licensing. I did have an inquiry just uh, yesterday, day before yesterday. Um, a fellow says to me uh, that he's thinking about getting a CDL. So here's the thing about getting a CDL license and becoming a truck driver and driving for a trucking company. The pick a good truck driving school and they don't have to be, you know, six months long either. They can be, you know, X number of weeks long and get through it relatively quickly. Get your license that, um, get the license uh, that does not restrict you to automatic transmissions only. And other, be sure that you're instructed on and taught how to use a standard transmission with a clutch, uh, even though you may not use one. That allows you, it's kind of like um, when you go for your uh, uh, concealed carry handgun license, at least here in Texas, uh, if you use one, uh, I think it's the automatic uh, that, that, um, it'll allow you to carry an automatic and a revolver both. If you, if you test out with your revolver, you can only carry a revolver. So get the one that requires you to test out using a, uh, standard transmission with clutch.
I went to truck driving school twice, once in 2006, and that was a short-lived span. Uh, and then from 2006 to 2012, I did other things and I allowed my CDL license to lapse. And when I decided to go back to truck driving, I had to go back to truck driving school and do a, what they called a refresher course, which I did. I remember the officer that administered the test that time in 2012. He said, I've never felt more safe from a, from a trainee. And I said, well, I did drive before once upon a time. He said, well, that explains it. You did just fine. I passed with a 95% on the, uh, on the driving portion of the, uh, of the test. And, and that was fine. That was fine. Now, Something to understand about truck driving schools. They are not, they might tell you, but they are not designed, equipped. They don't really teach you how to drive a truck. They teach you certain basic maneuvers. They do teach you shifting and clutching and backing. And uh, uh, they teach you just enough to pass the test. And I've had the, uh, the uh, officers tell me that. I've had uh, even the schools themselves, the instructors that I had. Yeah, we're just, our job is to get you through the test. You come to us to get your CDL license, and that's what they're getting you. That doesn't make you a truck driver. And there may be a little hubris in that, but um, that's kind of the uh, general attitude. Uh, amongst the training and testing personnel, state and uh, school. All right. And then you get your job. You get signed on with a company and never buy a truck if you're just starting out. Don't become an owner operator. Do not run as if they try to sell you on an independent contractor contract where you're leasing your truck from the company. Run, run. It is because you don't know what's going to happen during your, during your training period. Uh, you may accident out and you're stuck with a $40,000, $50,000 debt. Do not buy a truck until you are well experienced in driving a truck. And that might take two or three years. I can't tell you how many times I've been encouraged to buy a truck and become an owner operator or independent contractor. I came back to trucking when I was 52 years old in 2012. And I'm not exactly a young man anymore. And it usually takes five to seven years to pay off those lease contracts. And they always say, well, think about how much money you can make. Uh, here's the truth of the matter, and I'd be happy to discuss this with anybody. Average truck driver that works for a company, especially some of the big name companies, you're not ever going to make more than, I don't care what they say. Oh, most of our drivers make 120000 a year. No, they don't. Well, they, you, know, you might have a few, but that's not your average. That's not your median. That's your top 10%. Uh, you're going to make about uh, anywhere from sixty to eighty thousand a year, and uh, and that's going to depend upon the number of miles that you drive. And you may have more miles. And the low guys on the totem pole, forget about totem pole, forget about it. You're going to make barely forty, and good luck with that.
That's one of the things that drove me away from truck driving in 2006 when I had my first go around. There were other issues too, but that was one of the main ones. Sitting, you know, for four and five days on the road away from home is never a pleasant thing. It, it just, it messes with your mind. And all you got to think about is how much money you're losing and how much you're in debt and how much you're going bankrupt. Also decide what kind of trailer you want to drive. Whether you want to drive refrigerated, flatbed, dry van, you know, 53 foot. I drive a 48 foot, I think it is, um, not positive. 48 foot uh, tanker. You know, you can do gasoline if you want to and make deliveries every day to have a route. or uh, hazmat chemical like I do. But coming out of truck driving school, you're gonna have to get those first couple of years of experience in with accident-free, uh, on-time delivery, do everything right. And once you've done that, then you'll be a hot product to go to just about anywhere else you want to go to uh, uh, drive what you want to drive. Now, my company, which is expanding into different parts of the uh, a country with satellite terminals and expanded operations and so forth. Well, let's see here. Uh, uh, there's not a lot of companies, the big box companies, I'm not going to call their names, but you see them on the highway every day. They're very commonplace. They will hire drivers right out of truck driving school, and they will expect you to be more than what the schools train you to be. Let me just say it that way.
and they'll put you through a four to six to eight week training period, depending upon how well you do, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more. And a training period consists of you driving and the trainer sleeping in the sleeper with the curtain drawn and not paying attention to you. That happened to me twice. Except for one guy who was really good. Um, and another one that was okay. And I won't go into all that, but just simply to say, it's not, I mean, a lot of it is self-directed. You're going to have to practice best be, uh, uh best practices and figure out what those are on your own. And now there's some logic to that because you are going to be driving on your own and all of those maneuvers that you're going to do where everything from, you know, backing, Uh, getting loaded, going to the dock, talking with those people, driving on ice. You're going to have to learn on your own. Now, you can talk to other drivers and they can... offer suggestions and that's, you know, that's all it is. But until... you gain the experience of doing it on your own. You're, you know, you're always going to be on your own. Now, here's something else very seriously to keep in mind. Trucking companies are known to be less than complete and full and forthcoming with the truth. And so anything they tell you, make sure you get it in writing. Uh, yes, we guarantee 2,500 miles a week, 3,000 miles a week. Yes, we guarantee weekends off. Yes, we guarantee you'll be home, you know, whatever it is that you want that they say they'll give you, get it in writing. Now, not every company is like that, but there are far too many that are, and that's why... One of the things that gives trucking a bad name. Now, here's another thing that gives trucking a bad name. And that is that most trucking companies, especially the big companies, have anywhere from 80, 90 to 150 percent turnover every year. Now, some of that's from the old guys retiring. Average age of a truck driver in trucking I, last I saw a couple of years ago was 57 years old. So trucking, and recently the DOT has set forth measures to allow drivers to come into truck driving as young as 18 years old. Used to be 21. And there's a reason for that. They can't hold the drivers. The older drivers are leaving. Not enough new guys are coming in. And so they have to... lower the uh, age limit. And part of the reason for that is, is because they have such a high rate of turnover. Now, here's what most companies do. Not all, but most. They don't really value, value you. And that's a true statement. They really don't. That said, Now, 
they think that most truck, uh, that truck drivers are a dime a dozen. There's always a new flock coming in, looking for jobs, and you can be replaced with them. For all of their talk of wanting experienced, quality truck drivers, they don't want to seem to make them apprenticeships, training programs, you know, you're going to have, there are going to be bumps and they make you feel like lower than dog turd when you have a minor incident. And well, who wants to work in that kind of environment where you're made to feel like absolute rubbish? As I say, some companies are better than others on that. Mine, you know, I've had my share of oopsies. I've never had a DOT reportable accident on the road. You know, cross my fingers. Have I bumped into posts in shippers yards? Yeah, I've done that. Concrete posts painted yellow. Lower than the height of the hood, so you can't see them. You get a little close to them, they go below your eye line. And they got this nice little saying uh, in trucking, get out and look. Well, first of all, getting out and looking takes a lot of time. Get out of your truck, da, 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 walk around the truck, whatever. Now, there are times that it's apropos to do that. Other times that you're trying to get on with what you're trying to do. And if you don't have an inkling that there is a hazard in your way, you're less inclined to get out to see if there's a hazard in your way, then if the object in question had been, you know, two feet higher. And so you get a lot of that kind of stuff going on. And so, but, um, so there's an extreme, and, and most companies will give you three incidents. They say it's insurance. Well, the insurance company. Well, I've learned a little bit about that too. Insurance companies, they say, uh, will allow you three incidences before they terminate you and, and you're gone. You've, you've sunk thousands of dollars into getting this license. Uh, you have invested a certain amount of time in getting this license. And within the space of three months, you have three minor I say minor, they could be DOT reportable accidents. They could be uh, what they call incident versus accident. And uh, okay, let's see. I think I'm on the against the grain pass now. And so, 
you know, three incidences in a six month, 12 month period of time is going to get you fired and you're left there holding the bag. Maybe you went into debt to go to truck driving school and that costs you five, six thousand uh, dollars. You've been working at the job for five, six, seven months, and all of a sudden, you're out, and you got all that debt, and you got all that time invested, and so there's no, there's no real training other than you teaching yourself, and it's, it's, there's nothing to teach you except the actual practical experience. One of the things I've learned is that most accidents occur while backing, Don't let the pressure of it, and, and most of those happen in the truck stop because you're trying to, it's dark. You're trying to back into a parking space. It's tight as can be. You don't have a clear path to get into it. And so you've got to make all of these backing maneuvers and turns, slight turns, you know, but you've got to get out and look. That's, that's one case scenario where you just got to get out and look. And there's always the guys that want to come over and help you. Never forget that you are responsible for that truck. And so when you've got a guy that's trying to help you and say, yeah, come on, come on, come on. And then bam, you're responsible. He's not responsible. You are. He bears no responsibility just because you are following his hand signals. Oh, sorry about that. He walks off. And there's always these guys that want to help you and say, turn it this way. No, turn it that way. I tell them, I say, if you're going to help me, the only time I want your help is I want you to give me one of these kinds of signals. Tell me how close I'm getting to the object in question. And do not give me the stop sign unless I am in imminent danger of uh, contact. Now, imminent danger of contact, when you're just inching along, you know, might be four inches, might be six inches. It's not three feet, because I need those three feet to maneuver to back into that hole. And so you got some guys that, especially when you're in a plant, and they're not, they might be used to backing trucks or, or, or assisting trucks, but... I'm going to say no, they're really not because they have no idea conceptualization about how much room you need to turn those trucks and how much every inch counts when you're right down there in immediate or imminent contact. And sometimes 
some of the places you back into, you're going to wonder to yourself, who came up with this? And it's absolutely dangerous. That's one of the reasons why I refuse to go to the Northeast beyond, at least on the routes that we pull, uh, beyond uh, central Pennsylvania. Uh, you get up any further in there and it is absolutely mindlessly crazy. Um, and, I, and I won't go up in there. And fortunately, my company allows me to have some discretion over which routes I want to take. And so central Pennsylvania, it's one of the reasons why I like Canada. I've never had an issue. Uh, but a lot of those, you know, I don't know if this makes any difference or not. Some of you guys that know might tell me is that uh, Canada is so union dominated and maybe there's something about union rules in the construction of those locations that say, no, you're not giving him six inches. He needs six feet to get into here. I don't know. I just, I'm bloviating on that point. When I came to truck driving, I did not come to truck driving because of some overwhelming sense of love or family tradition or anything other than, I don't know what else to do. But since being a truck driver now, Having been a truck driver now for over 10 years, this time, since 2012, I don't count that. First period so much at 2006, but um, I don't want to do anything else. Do I wish I had the uh, qualifications to do something else? Sometimes, yes. But really, sitting in a truck by myself, uh, going from A to B, making delivery, and not have to deal with another human being suits me just fine. Except my wife. You know, we talk on the phone several times a day. I got my truck driving buddies that I talk to. I tell my dispatch, I tell my safety manager, why do you think I like the extra long runs? It takes, uh, you know, five, six, eight, ten days. Why do you think I like doing those kinds of runs? Because it keeps me out of your office.
figure out how you're going to eat on the road too. You've got to have a plan because if you don't have a plan, you'll end up weighing 500 pounds with diabetes and uh, congestive heart failure real quick, real fast. The food on the road in the truck stops is not healthy in any sense of the word. And it's certainly not homemade in any sense of the word. So you got all the crap that goes into uh, truck driver food, MSG and uh, sodium and all the stuff. Most trucks will uh, have enough room to where you get uh, sleeper cabs, uh, international trucks, Volvos, uh, Freightliners, Peterbilt, uh, Kenworth, uh, have enough room where you can put in a typical, traditional college dorm size uh, refrigerator. And the one is just a little bit tall. The one is kind of almost square shaped. It's a small itty bitty thing. Then you got another one that's about 30 inches tall. In most trucks that'll sit easily behind the uh, passenger seat in the sleeper berth area. And I, my, my wife cooks all my food for me and she's very good, keeps me very satisfied. And uh, I can put in that refrigerator, she uses the uh, Rubbermaid containers and they will hold about uh, 20, plus or minus a couple. Uh, they will hold 20 of the uh, two and a half by two and a half by two and a half square uh, food containers. And so I get, you know, I get all kinds of good food. Generally speaking, I'd say go to work for a smaller company, not a larger company, where you actually get to know the people and feel like you're becoming a part of the team and not a number in a spreadsheet. All right, let's wash it off and see what we got. So those are just some spontaneous thoughts based on my, upon, upon my years of experience about trucking companies, about trucking, about getting your CDL, about trucking. Now, let me say this. You know, we live in a very difficult age today. If we don't live in the 50s where, you know, mom stayed at home with the kids and dad went off to work and he could make enough income to buy a house and raise two or three kids and support a house. 
we don't live in that age anymore and haven't for quite some time. You've got to have the personal relationship, wife, significant other, children. You've got to build a life while you're on the road, which means you've got to have a, 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 uh, I'm going to use the word wife because I believe in the Christian tradition of wife and children and et cetera. Uh, you know, she may be working out of the home, have a career of her own, but you're working together. There has to be that uh, mutuality of working together. Um, you know, poor Bill Clinton. I wouldn't want to be married to Hillary. He's a dog anyway, so I'm not going to give him too much sympathy. But you got to have that mutual support system at home. Because you've already heard me go over the numbers of what a truck driver can expect to make. Now, an owner operator, yeah, they make two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars a year. This is a significant point too. But there's a word, two words. Let me just say these two words: gross net. Yeah, they might make two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand a year gross, from which they've got to deduct all of their expenses. They are completely responsible for maintaining, maintaining permits, maintenance, tires, fuel for the load. You've contracted with a company, but you've got to take care of all that stuff yourself, which gets deducted from on your taxes. Now, here's why I didn't become an owner-operator or independent contractor. It's real simple. An owner-operator after expenses doesn't make more than 10 or 15% more than what a company driver makes until that truck is paid off. And by the time the truck is paid off, you're looking to get a new truck. Uh, after five to seven years and the truck's all beat up and, and I'm going to get a new truck and Because if you can maintain your truck, and get it paid off, then all that money, $3,500 to $5,000 a month, and get your truck paid off, then all of that goes into general revenue and can be passed on to personal income and in, in your taxes. But I see very few drivers who can get that far along in their tax planning and in their payment structures to get the truck paid off and move on in that fashion. And so it just never, it's not enough of a difference to make a difference in my mind, the gross versus net versus what company drivers get paid uh, to become an owner operator, uh, if it was if it was two times, three times the amount that a company driver made, then yeah, it makes a lot of sense. But 10, 15 percent difference between what a company driver makes and what your net income is. No, you can keep that. I don't want the headache. Don't want the headache. And of course, people like to think that they're strategic planners, right? I'm smarter. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So they get themselves involved with a truck contract purchase or lease agreement. And 
The trucks are built shoddily today. The trucks do not withstand the punishment of the road. You're always, every owner operator I have ever met has been in the shop the first six months on a new truck. Yeah, great, fine. There, you're spending one to two weeks a month in the shop, not those wheels. If those wheels aren't turning, you're not earning. And so I just have, ne and that's 10 years experience talking. Every owner operator I've ever known has breakdowns and they're down two to, you know, two to three weeks uh, when they're broke down and it's crazy. And they always, the ones that became my friends and I would talk to on the phone, they would always complain, I'm not making any money at this. What am I doing? I said, well, I tried to tell you. Of course, they don't want to hear that, do they? And then before you know it, they're gone and out. You doing all right over there? Nod your head. Oh, oh you doing all right? Okay. All right, that's good on the, let me set this over here. My boker set it out of the way. We're getting ready to go to the head shave with the gold dollar 66. Now, when I'm at home, I just take my time. I don't try to rush. And if you're staying with me this long, I appreciate it. So when you're learning to drive a truck and you're in that training probationary period, take your time. Take your absolute time. Especially when you get into those backing situations, which is where most of the accidents occur. The accidents that I hear about that happen out on the open road happen for a lot of different reasons. Uh, drugs and alcohol, uh, uh, diverted attention, distracted driving. Um, and let me just, when you're in the city, when you're in a metropolitan area, in a congested area, your focus should 100% be on the road, on anticipating everybody's move. Your eyes are scanning. You see the obstacles. You're anticipating. Uh, you know, here, here comes uh, little Miss Teenager. She's got her nose in her cell phone, and she's an accident waiting to happen. And she is or he, um, one of my best friends, stopped at a stoplight, in town driving, surface streets, stopped at a stoplight, and all of a sudden he feels, boom, collision at the, at the rear of the truck. And he gets out to check it out. And here's, he says, it, it just broke his heart because here's this girl, uh, teenager, early 20s, distracted with her cell phone, didn't see the stop truck at the signal light, big tanker. And plowed right into the back, what they call the safety bar. All trucks have a safety bar at the rear of the truck now so that cars don't make collision and impact and slide underneath the trailer or the tandems, the rear wheels. And of course, she's not hurt. Nobody's hurt. And it was just a sad incident because it goes on her record. The police had to be called and et cetera. My friend was not injured. He has since, my good friend has since passed away. Um, got cancer, I believe. Never told anybody 
that he was sick like that. Now I got another friend, same kind of situation, city driving, surface roads, stoplight, he stopped at the stoplight. And he never felt the collision. He's fully loaded, came to a stop at the end of the, the surge in the truck with the chemical. And what he felt, he thought, was just the surge of the chemical in the truck. So the light turns green and he starts to pull away and it's heavy. It's like he's dragging something and the car is a small car and it hit that safety bar and connected and so he's dragging this car. And so he stops the vehicle, gets out and goes and takes a look at the rear. And here's this car. Connected into the safety bar at the rear. And it's an older gentleman. Retired, whatever, whatever. He had a heart attack and died and collided with the truck. And it was a sad situation all around because the guy died, but he had a, he was an elderly gentleman. So my friend says, and Again, the police were called and this was just a, a few blocks uh, on, the, on the main road right out in front of the company the terminal. And so the safety manager got in his car and drove down there and guided the police through the process and acted as uh, intercessory for the, the driver, my friend. And everything was fine because it was clear as could be as to what actually happened. The guy was dead, not because of the collision. It was, he just came, he was stopping, came in behind the truck. He had a heart attack. He died and collided with the truck at a low rate of speed. But I'm of the opinion that if you have any you know, your a sense of your surrounding, there's no reason to have an accident on the road. Now, things are going to happen beyond your control. But there's no reason that there should be anything your fault because of your lack of attention. If you're paying attention to your mirrors, if you're paying attention to your surroundings, you're watching for obstacles. Uh, in the in city driving, surface street driving. Um, and see, that's why I like the long distance driving because 90% of your time you're in the city, or out in the country rather. You're out in the country, nobody's around you. And you might let your guard down a little bit more when you're in circumstances like that. But not much. I mean, it's all a question of your eyes continually moving and scanning as to what's around you and maintaining your, uh, your lane position is so very important at all times with, you know, country driving, you might not scan your mirrors as much as you do when you're in city driving, but if you're maintaining your lane position, uh, you're not, you're less concerned about what's coming up behind you than you might otherwise be as in city driving, but it's fun. It's, it's just, 
I call it a, a, a real-time video game on wheels. And if you were with me this past week when I spent the night in Lyman, Colorado and drove from Lyman all the way to uh, Guthrie, Oklahoma, the uh, roads were iced and snow packed for a, a good ways in the morning, early hour mornings from Lyman to out toward Hayes, Kansas, Interstate 70. And... Uh, Truck driving has often been described as kind of a final resting place for those who don't know how to do anything else. And, and I understand that. I mean, but if you make that decision to go into truck driving, it can be something. You know, the, I see people, a lot of people, some people. Yeah, yeah, my family's, my, you know, fifth generation truck driver. Okay, fine, good. There's a lot of people like that. And that's all well and good. Uh, but it's also a haven for good guys who spin their wheels, never got any real traction in life, or what they want to do has become closed to them, like in my case. It also becomes a haven for derelicts. And so just be mindful of that too. But it can be a rewarding. In the last 10 years, I can tell you, you've heard me say this before. Yes, with the cooperation and help of my good wife. But together, truck driving and what she does, uh, we've purchased two houses. In a, a sense, the first house that we ever bought, first house she ever bought in her life, the first house I ever bought in my life, we did it together when I was 55 years old. And obviously things that I had done previously in my life had never brought me to a point where I could buy a house. And of course, you know, that's always an important thing if you believe in the American dream and getting ahead and buying a house and building equity and following in mom and dad's footsteps uh, or brother and sister's footsteps. Buying a house is an important thing. And uh, raising your family, making uh, future plans. That's how you grow wealth and equity. And you want to feel like you're having, you know, you want to feel like you're building growth and equity. Uh, and if you're just treading water, that's very demoralizing uh, and on one's outlook of life. That's why having a good spouse, having a good wife. I speak as a man with a female spouse called a wife.
I'm gonna let that run for a minute. And some of the pitfalls to avoid, of course, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna belabor this too much, except to say that divorce is expensive and sometimes can be life ruining. And take years to recover from. And so a divorce in your late 20s, early 30s can take until your mid 50s to recover from. And by then, You know, half your life has passed you by. Overall, I have personally found truck driving to be rewarding, exciting. I come home and I turn on Ice Road Truckers on television and never turn it off because I'm so engaged in the whole process of trucking. And I learned something about trucking when I watch them when I come home. It's just that interesting. Listen, I've gotten to the end of my shave, my face shave, my head shave. Everything is good. Let's throw on a little bit of uh, alum. Cold water rinse there. So we use the uh, Boker Count Engelbert II, all that nice gold etching and so forth, blonde horn scale. We use the uh, Plasson number 20, 30 millimeter high mountain white. We use the uh, Martin de Congre Fougere and uh, use a little bit of Cremo at the beginning as a sort of pre-shave. Got the Fougere right there. And uh, that's it. Thank you for watching. And thank you for listening. And uh, we will see you down the road.